There was a black woman that uh, had a YouTube video out where she was beating her 60-year-old daughter. Did you guys see that? We have it upon our site at rebuildingtheman.com. And, and she was like pounding her and just smacking her upside the head and hitting the ear and just really punching in the stomach while at the same time cursing her out, calling her uh, T-H-O-T. Do you know what that is? You, you, you never heard of her. A thought is a whore. That's a new word for whore. The problem is the mother, the girl is just like the mother. The mother had on these little hot pants all up here, little pink hot pants and some little hard to top thing on, looking worse than her daughter. And she got to beat the daughter for being out of control. She was saying, you are embarrassing me. Can you imagine having a mother like that as a child? And your mother show up at school or something looking like that? And then the mother would get in front of the mirror and do her hair all up. And the daughter is just like the mother. But the mother doesn't see that in herself. And she's trying to make the daughter do something that she's not doing. You know, last Sunday we talked about parents don't cause your kids to resent. Well, when you're mean like that with your kids, when you're impatient with your kids, when you whoop your kids with anger, then you are, are causing them to resent. I realized from that, the reason that a lot of black men and women are so traumatized is because their mothers and grandmothers whooped them and smacked them upside the head while growing up with, with the intent, some of them, to make them better people. But they did it with the spirit of anger, which is hatred. And then they'll use the scripture where the Bible said, train a child, up. no, spare the rod and spoil the child, something like that, right? But the Bible was not talking about angry parents beating and correcting their children. An angry parent cannot correct a child. You have no love. There is no love and anger. And so you're trying to correct the child. You're correcting them with, um, with anger. And then so you end up messing the kids up and you wonder what happened to them. But I noticed that with white mothers, they tend to uh, not whoop their kids or spank their kids. Sometimes they do. But they tend to be very impatient with their kids. You know, like, I told you to sit down. And mommy is not going to put up with this anymore. That kind of stuff. But that's still anger. And with that anger, it still corrupts the child. Because there is no love in anger. Every human being who has anger lack love. Absolutely have no love. That's why we have to get over it, because you cause your kids, uh, you traumatize your kids. A lot of parents, they mean well. They don't mean to mess up the kids. They want what's best, but they're correcting you with the wrong spirit. And that's why you end up, you know, they end up messed up, even though you're trying to do what's right for them. I remember one time when my mom, she caught me, and she, and she had, like, one of the big worker wooden um, things. I swear. And she used to whoop me and my brother with it. She whooped us both at the same time because it was, like, real long. She was like, Shh. Wow. How old were you at the time? About, like, seven. You were seven years old? How old do you know? Nine. Nine. Wow. And that hurt, huh? I can't hear you. Yeah, it hurt. Yeah. Yeah. And it's done with anger. That's what the problem is. You, got to, you must forgive so that you can operate from the right spirit. But that mother, that woman needs to be put in jail. She really does. She fought her daughter like a ghetto child. Like she would fight somebody in the hood, another woman in the hood. She looked like a hood rat. and want her daughter to be something else. And her daughter said that she was about to tell her mother that she were... She was having sex. She wanted to tell her, but she couldn't find a way to tell her. Also, they had to end up going to the hospital. And the daughter later wrote that she went to the hospital because she was having anxiety attacks and headaches. And I'm imagining, can you imagine being raised by a woman like that? And so now as a young girl, she, she's already having these anxiety attacks and she's going to be on medication 
and all that kind of madness for the rest of life. Unless someone comes along and says to her, you need to forgive your mother. She's insane. Uh, she is of her father, the devil, but you need to forgive her so you can overcome that. And she's not going to, it's rare. I hope I'm wrong, but she's not going to hear that. They're going to blame it on racism. They're going to blame it on poverty. They're going to blame it on the man. Everybody but the mother. It reminds me of those sick women that was at the Democratic National Convention. Trayvon Martin mother and uh, uh, Michael Brown mother and the rest of the who it rats. They up there blaming everybody for the death of their kids except themselves and the adults who got killed because they overreacted to the cop. We have a a no fault system now. Nobody, not nobody. Most people do not take responsibility for their own failures. They don't say, oh, this is, I'm wrong. I'm sorry. This is me. I'm wrong. We don't hear that. And it's always blaming somebody else when it all starts in the home. Always doubt the lie. Doubt the lie, doubt the lie, doubt the lie. And then you can have faith. And so someone asked me, well, what do you mean? And I wrote it down here. When you say doubt the doubt, what do you mean by that? What do I mean when I say doubt the lie? Whenever you realize you're thinking and uh, you hear your own voice in your head or you, or you realize you're listening to your thoughts, uh, come back to the present. And that's how you doubt the lie? That's what I do, yes. It doesn't work. Well, um, uh, they always come back. Um, I come back to the, to the present moment, and then there's, you're back doing whatever you was doing. Um, but then the thoughts come back again, or you realize you're listening to your, that voice in your head again. Um, I come back to the present, but that goes on. The, the, thoughts, seem, the thoughts never go away. Um, um, but when they do, or when I realize I'm listening to that voice in my head, I come back to the present. And does it help? It, it helps, yes. In what way? Well, um, I think once you start listening to your thoughts uh, or following your thoughts, uh, you kind of go deeper into them, and uh, uh, you become more suggestible, and, and you start listening to them more and more. And to me, I realize it's better just to come back to the present moment uh, rather than going down uh, the rabbit hole of your imagination. Oh, okay. Who else? How many people know how to doubt the lie now? Um, I was, because we are, you know that we become witnesses, right? Right. Once we become children of God, uh -huh. we have to point the way for other people. Well, I had a call today from my, one of my nieces. It's an alcoholic. It's like... She started uh, saying, I love you, I love you, Auntie, I love you, do you love me, and all that. And so I, I, I didn't know she what... She was drunk while she was saying it? Well, probably she drinks 24 hours a day. <laughs> and so she, she asked, do you love me? Do you love me? And she does that Isn't all that the something? time. Even she when you're drunk, yeah. you got to know that the other person loves you back in order for you to love them. <laughs> and then she started talking about uh, somebody saying... What did you say when you, she asked, do you well, love me? Well, I'm getting... Well, I, I told... I didn't know what to say at first. I didn't want to tell you, of course I love you. But then I did tell her I loved her, you know. Oh, okay. uh, and then... Uh, because I don't really know what love is, you know, yet. Then how you know you love her then? Well, I don't. But you but told I you love her. It. I said it because I didn't know what to say. Okay? <laughs> so you lied to her. Well, I don't know. <laughs> and so anyway, she went on saying her, about her mother, how she hated her and her mother hated her and all of this, just cussing out her mother. Her mother's dead. And her I mother's told her, dead? Her mother's dead. Wow. And, I and yet her, mother lived. Long live yeah. mama. Yeah, and so I told her, why don't you forgive your mother? You know, and she goes, don't judge me. And I said, I'm not judging you, I'm trying to help you. And so she went on and on, and I told her, look, somebody's in the door. I got to go. Okay, goodbye. Oh, you lied? Well, I didn't know how to <laughs> let it go. So you lied to her? Yeah. To, uh, well, I guess I did. <laughs> did you lie or not? Yes, I did. Was someone at the door? No. <laughs>
<laughs> so you lied about loving her, and you lied about someone being at the door. Uh-huh. She called the right person. <laughs> <laughs> she called a Christian woman that doesn't right. live in her thoughts. Well, yeah, that's true. It's amazing, too. I see situations like that where men and women of God can be a monster children of the lie, and they're afraid to be themselves. They won't be themselves. They're, they're, they'll try a little bit, but they act like the company that they're around because they are afraid of having to deal with standing up in a monster friends. In That's true. Room. That's true. I've seen that. I was, I was uh, like, a, I didn't want to hurt her feelings. See that? That is so weak. Uh-huh. There's no love in that. Her feelings were already hurt. That's, that's why she called you. Yeah. And just imagine had you not had that fear. You had real love for her. And she's calling her aunt to say, I hate my mama. I'm messed up. And you were not able to help her because you could not be an example of the truth. You could not be yourself. I did so tell you her failed to forgive her. her mother. What? I told her to forgive her mother. But you backed down when she said, don't judge me. And yeah, then all because of a sudden I know you what's hear gonna knock go at the on. door. I know I've got to go on and on and on. That's how she does it. It goes on and on and on. And, <laughs> and, I and that's why you why. lied to her? I guess I didn't want to hear it. Oh, man. Does God treat you that way? No. And you should treat her the way God treat you. Okay. And how's that? With patience and let her go on and on and on. No, not let her go on. God. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. <laughs> God doesn't let you go on and on and on. Oh, we got to get you well so you can handle. See, we want to be ready for these type of situations. Well, well how would I, you I did do a it? wedding yesterday. How would you and do it, Jesse? In the vows, when, when I asked the woman, and these were a young couple. And so all the little friends, they were young, and they all were their little boyfriends and girlfriends together. And then the, the brides father and mother was there, and the groom's father and mother was there, right? So when I get to the woman vows, I said, do you promise to love and obey your husband? Do you promise to love and obey? And I kept repeating, obey, obey. And you can see this young crowd just not liking that word, obey. <laughs> it was so much fun. <laughs> And that's how we have to be when we come up against the children of the lie because they only have anger and judgment on their side. They have no power. It's just that you listen to the devil and you allow him to prevent you from exercising the authority that God has given you, mm -hmm. the power over the lie. When she said, you don't judge me and blah, blah, blah. Now somebody's at the door and then you lied and said, I love you. When she asked, do you love me? If you don't love her, don't say you love her. And if you love her, you tell her the truth. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. God tells us the truth all the time. And he doesn't care how we feel about that. Okay. You have to learn to be in the world, but not of it. So tell him the truth. Always. I don't want to hear this or... Right. <laughs> Whatever it <laughs> might Well, you can't plan what you're going to say with truth. Uh -huh. It has to be revealed to you. Okay. So. You can't plan what God will have you to say in a moment. I see. In that very moment. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah. But, okay. Okay. Poor you. But thank you for that. Well, she will be calling you back. Oh, she does. All yeah. the time. So you'll get another chance to overcome this. Oh, I, I'll have a lot of chances, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Did you, when you got married, did you say, I promise to obey my husband? You were there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> did you answer yes to that? Yes, I did. You said, yes. I will obey him? Yes. Does and I remember my friends were squirming, too. <laughs> they were? <laughs> they were like, is she really going to say that? <laughs> I know this news like educated women, young men and women there yesterday, and, and they don't like that word for the wife to obey the husband. Right. And, and why don't they like that word? I, I think they're brought up in the system of women are equal to men, and they are as smart as men, and they can have the same jobs and the same pay. And for some reason, they take that into the marriage as well and believe that nobody can tell the other one what to do. Wow, what a mess, huh? Yeah. 
just changing the order of God. And that's why these things don't work. Right. Because they have broken the order, the law, by creating the law of their father, the devil. Yeah. And so I realized that before yesterday, but especially yesterday, I realized because I laid out the order of life and how the man is ahead of his wife and he should love her in the same manner that Christ loved him. And a man that loves his wife the way Christ loved him, that's perfect love. Right. A woman would love that kind of love. But these women today won't give that a chance. And the men are too weak. Oh, the men are too weak to know how to reinforce it, reinforce that. Yesterday, I noticed that this wedding, too, is that all the men that were there, young men, they are repeating what we have done as older men. I noticed that at the wedding, the women had like an uppity attitude, like they were just better than the men. And then the men just running around trying to please them and just making sure they stand with them and hold them and don't go to the table by yourself. And do you want something to eat? I'm like, this, I thought we were changing this. But and, and do women think they are better than men? Not all, of course. Not all, not all, not all. I'm just wondering because they had like this thing going on. Well, I can't speak for all women and what they think, but what I will say is that I think women have seen so many men not not be strong and not do what they needed to do. That including the women, their fathers, huh? Including their fathers. Yeah. And so when you ask a woman to categorically say she's going to obey this man, she's thinking, well, it depends on what he's asking me to do <laughs> because if he's not asking in love or he's not got my best interest at heart, no, I'm not going to obey him. And so they, they're just afraid to just say, yes, I will obey my husband because you don't know what he's going to ask you to do. And, and he may be mean or he may be selfish or he may be doing things that they don't want to agree to. But if you are a righteous woman, you're not thinking about all that. You're, like, you're living life as it's happening and you're dealing with things accordingly. You know, you're not thinking ahead like that. What does this happen? What does that happen? What is this? You're just a, a, a woman that love what's right, you know. But the problem is their fathers and mothers have failed them, so they don't know what's right anymore. Right. They've been taught a lie. Yeah. This must be hard on men uh, from 50, let me see, from 55, from 60 down. Because they have to do a lot of work to please a woman nowadays. We didn't have to do that. We just did what was right. If they didn't like it, fine. If they did, fine. And they were okay with that. They were, women back then were not trying to make you just hover around them and all that kind of stuff. They, they seemed more secure when I was growing up than they do today. And so I don't know, is that having anything to do with the lack of father or what? But I wouldn't want to be having to worry about dating today. It's just a mess on both parts, the men and the women. It's too much work. And men are not supposed to be spending money on a girlfriend unless they went out to a line to a date. That's it. Do you doubt every thought? Well, I think that, you know, what John said resonated a lot with me, which is to come into the moment and be present. Uh -huh. And what I noticed from that is that, you know, once I'm aware in the moment, the thoughts don't have control over me. And what good has that done you? It's enabled me to, um, when I've come into the moment, to, to actually see the truth. Um, it's, been a, it's enabled me to be guided uh, by the Holy Spirit, um, to also use my words wisely with people, and to have, like, this young lady to my right, um, you, when somebody calls me up and has an issue, um, I'm not in my head. I'm actually very present in the moment and have the right words to address a situation. Um, so in a lot of ways, it's given me tremendous peace uh, because I'm dealing with each moment as it comes up. For me, um, I think the do thoughts, in my case, is they're pretty sneaky. And it's like, before you know it, oh, there it is again. There's another a thought to look at. But I'll look at it, but sometimes it, it messes so much with your psyche that you know, you get kind of swirled with it for, for a moment, and I don't want to struggle with it and hate it, you know, because it, it does tend to take you down. 
and then I'll see that and I'll watch that. And of course, the, of course, that anger goes away or whatever it's trying to do. But still, they're there, and sometimes you're not aware, and they have a strange way of sneaking in. <laughs> so for the person that want to know, how do you do that? What actions do you take to just, doubt every thought? I just come to the moment. Just what would that mean, realize come it. to the moment? Well, let me put it this way. And the reason I'm asking because you come probably to run into, moment. just like I've been asked this question, and yeah. her, her, her niece wanted to know that you love me, and she ran. And it if really I'm walking down hard. the road, and you say, come into the moment, and I'm going to ask her, well, what do you mean, come into the moment? What moment? And how do I come into the moment? Well, I mean, if I'm going to tell somebody, I, I mean, I would just say you have to come to the moment. And, and I know it's hard to understand that because it's taken me a quite, quite a long time to, to grasp and to realize what's really trying to control me. But for somebody else... What that, is trying to, con to control well, you? Well, I know that spirit's always there. It doesn't rest. You know? What spirit? Evil. <laughs> I mean, I wake up in the morning, I mean, I'll just go to the bathroom before I know it, it's singing some song or it's, it's saying something already, and I'm going, now I know that's not me. How do you know for sure it's evil? Well, I'm pretty sure it's evil. How do you know, so you, how do you know for because sure? Because it's nonsense. It, it doesn't even make sense. I mean, it's just rattling on. It's, you know, babble. And that's evil? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So trying to communicate with you is evil. Yeah, it's trying to communicate with me. I know it's evil. Okay. You know. And how do you know when you're not involved in it? Uh, when I become aware of it. And so for a new person who doesn't know yeah. and understand how, what we were talking about, what would you recommend for them? I don't know. Oh, okay. Other than just telling them you need to come to the moment and just be aware Okay. All right. Our battle is a, a spiritual battle. It's a warfare between good and evil all the time. And of ourselves, we know nothing. And of ourselves, we can do nothing. And one thing I've noticed about evil, it, it takes everything that we hear and learn and use it against us to deceive us, to make, we, make us think that we have something that we don't have. It'll imitate whatever the Bible says, whatever God is. Evil imitates that and presents itself as God. And when you are a born again of God, when you repent, when you forgive and you uh, enter into the kingdom of heaven within, you are now developing a new nature in God, right? And one aspect of that is that you start to recognize God's voice. He said, my children shall know me by my voice. And, and then so Satan's voice, the one that we were talking about, that's always bringing the doubt. He's lying to you one way or another. We start to get away from that and become a, at a, a distant from us. And so it can't manipulate and control us like it did prior to entering into the kingdom of heaven. And then, but once you enter in, then you start growing spiritually. It's like a little baby that's born, start to grow and discover. And, and so your conversation about things, it go beyond, well, I'm just riding down the road and I saw this and I came back into the present. That's like an introduction of what happens, but it's not the meat of what's happening at all. It's like when you sit to pray, the prayer is not the thing you should be focused on. It's the growth that comes as a result of that. And I notice a lot of people, it's just the same old story all the time. They never get past. It's like they're not growing as children of God. It's so much more than just waiting to confront someone or having the right words to say or, or just being in the present and all that. And for some reason, the mind is still playing the trick. And the one thing that Satan is good at, he's real good at imitating God. Very good at that. He'll quote you the scriptures. He'll make you see things that's not there. He'll convince you that right is wrong, wrong is right. He'll build you up and tear you down. He can cause you to become afraid. He can cause you to be happy and cause you to be sad. 
have fear. He, he is like, can do all that stuff to you. And none of those things God does to you. None of those things. Not what I owe what I just said involved in being a child of God. Because when you come into that place where he is within, you have perfect peace all the time. You're not going to this. You grow. And I don't feel like people are growing. And, and I think it's because it just learns stuff. And there are so many people, every angry person is still living and controlled by their imagination. But because Satan live off your anger, that's why he doesn't want you to forgive. So even when I say forgive, you know, uh, for the last 26 years, I've been trying to help black men and, and women get uh, all people, really, but especially blacks to get over there, to know themselves, take control of their lives by forgiving their parents and forgiving white people, stop hating themselves. You know, they say, oh, you just Uncle Tom. You just, you just this. They won't even accept the word forgiveness nowadays because Satan, their father, will not let them. They literally think that our problem is a physical problem. It has something to do with color, and it has nothing to do with that at all. It has everything to do with being angry first at your parents and then at yourself and the world around you. Sometimes other things can cause trauma too, not just the parents. But it's all about that. And forgiving is the answer to it. But most people won't allow, them, allow themselves to forgive. So here's how you doubt. doubt. First of all, somehow or another, you got to believe that every thought you get is a lie. Everyone. No such thing as a true thought. Whatever the thought is telling you that you're seeing or hearing is not true. Just and what you do, just knowing that alone is letting it go. You know, and let it go doesn't require your will or your effort at all. Just knowing that every thought I get is from the, my father, the devil. If you just really know that, it doesn't take any, you know, coming into the moment and all that stuff. It just take knowing that. And so when you hear his voice, you just hear it like a truck going by down the road or something. You have no relationship with it. And when you do that, you're doubting the lie, and there is nothing left but the truth. The voice of God is right there. And in the voice of God, you, you start to learn more, discover. You start to live, and you start to grow, and you get beyond now saying, well, I just come into the moment, or I just do this. You grow like a child grow. But you're growing as a spiritual child because we are a spirit. And but I get the impression that some of you are still listening to the thought. It's like you're learning this stuff and you're blocked. And I don't know how to get you unblocked because I told you everything I need to tell you. You got to let that stuff go. You got to Your will is not be should not be done. It's God's will that should be done. One thing I know is about thoughts. Thoughts. The reason that we, God wants us to get to a point where we pray without ceasing, meaning that at all times, be aware of his presence. It's because thoughts um, blocks the soul. And, and so the soul is the mirror where Christ lives in us. And Christ is there to help us. And, and then in Christ is all love and all wisdom of his father. They're all right there. But thoughts are blocking you from seeing that. And it's prevent others from seeing that in you, too. And that's why Satan is constantly talking to you, because he doesn't want that mirror to shine. He doesn't want the reflection of Christ to shine through you. So he keeps you with stuff on your mind all the time. If you were saying just all the time, something stupid stuff. Because he doesn't want that light of God, the mirror to reflect through you. He wants the darkness to reflect through you. And that's why he keep doing that. And so you, that's why you don't see the image of God in a lot of people anymore. Because they're living in their imagination. They're living in darkness and they're being blocked. They're preventing the light from shining through. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, that's amazing. Hey, what's up there? Uh, let me do this. Let me take here first and then here. And here, 
Anybody have anybody doubt what I just said? Does it? Okay, go ahead. Um, yeah, for years you, you've been telling us to doubt every thought. Yes. But when I first started coming uh, uh, or seeking the truth, I, I heard that you had to pray first thing in the morning and first thing at night. So it, when it get towards the evening or at nighttime, you know, I, I would tell myself, "Oh, you got to pray." Uh, it's night. It's getting towards nighttime. You got to pray. And so I was like listening to that thought, and I thought that uh, that was acceptable. And uh, uh, but I was telling you about it, and you were saying that you, you was going to the Me- Megan Kelly show, and you was kind of in a hurry. And then you said, "Oh, you just listening to the devil." But in my mind, I thought that, oh, it's a good thought. It's, it's acceptable. <laughs> yeah. But, and then when you told me that, that I listened to the devil, it kind of it kind of helped heighten my awareness when I was listening to anything in my head. Yeah. But uh, I just wanted to share that. That's a good, good point. So if I say, okay, get up and pray 6 o'clock in the morning. And I say 6 because a lot of people don't like to get up at 4, right? Or if I... So six o'clock, get up and pray in the morning and then at night before bed, have that quiet time, your prayer time. So Satan will allot you into those definite times. And let's say that you can't do it at six. <laughs> you do it at five, right? And Satan going to say, that's too early. He told you six. Or, or you, he'll say, well, get up and get dressed now. Wait until you get to work, and then you can do it at six. And that's just how he would take what you say and use it against you. It's like the Bible says forgive. He will take that and define that for you. He will say, well, forgiveness means go and ask someone to forgive you for what you've done. But that's a lie. That's not what it means. And so he's twisted everything. And because you don't recognize his voice purely as the voice of the, the deceiver, you believe in those what seem like good things about what you've heard. And you're taking those good things and using them against you as well. You can't believe anything that he has to say. You have to doubt everything. Adam used to have nothing but faith. He never doubted the father. But then when he believed into the lie, he only has doubt. He can no longer believe the father, right? So now what we got to do is just to uh, disbelief just believe the lie, and then we have faith. We're back. Well, you just don't believe that tempter, because all the talk that he gives you is temptation, and we all know now that temptation is evil, right? Did you know that temptation is evil? See, if y'all were doing the right thing, you know that. Temptation is evil. That's why we ask God to deliver us from it. From temptation. Temptation is evil. Do you have a, a, a podcast question? Oh, let me take here first. Is this fun? This is why, you know, I, heard, I hear the worldly people telling young folks, you got to build your career. Do all that you can do. Hustle. Get up in the morning. At four o'clock in the morning, start building that house. You got to hustle. When God said... Seek first the kingdom of God and his right way and all be added to you. Meaning that if you come back to him, he's going to add everything to you. And that doesn't mean you're not going to work, but you're not going to have to do like the children of the world. Work like a slave, unhappy slave. And then when you get it, you're still unhappy. God doesn't tell us to hustle like that. He tells us to seek him. We got to come back to him and develop his character become his children, and then we draw the things unto us. Yes? Okay, this comment is from Periscope. She said, um, I know that I'm not a good example for my children, and I struggle with that every day. Right. And the only way you're struggling with it is because you hate yourself now, knowing that you have not, that you're not, you've not done the right thing about your kids. That's, don't do that either. What you do is just apologize to them for treating them in the wrong way and let it go. Go to your kids and say, hey, I was wrong. You know, I'm sorry for what I've done. I was wrong. And then move on because Satan is going to use that against you. Do you know 
that God never, ever, 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 ever uses anything against us? He does. Like I know many of you went out last night and smoked pot, right? And you, and you have fun. And then you woke up this morning knowing you were going to church and now you're feeling all guilty. I have sinned. That's not God doing that. That's Satan making you judge yourself for that. And then you think God is punishing you. So don't judge yourself. It's enough to realize that you were wrong, but it's wrong to hate yourself for being wrong because it's not God. God doesn't care about all that stuff. He's not concerned about that. The only thing he asks is that we forgive our fellow man so we can return to him and become an example of love. Let him work through us. That's all he cares about. And he'll take care of the rest. Yes, sir. So go and apologize to your kids. Admit what you've done. And just say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. And move on. Yes. Yeah. Uh, a minute ago, you asked uh, whether, you know, what it means to doubt the doubt. And then I said, I don't know. And then you said, disbelieve your thoughts. And I guess the question that I have for you is what is belief? That's a good question. Belief is not doubting. Belief is not something that you feel, taste, or touch. You feel doubt. You, You feel the pain of doubt. Fear, anxiety, worry, whatever you get. Whatever. That's from doubt. But when you have faith, belief, there's no feeling. It's just an easy life. You're living your life. So it's it just, uh, faith would be, uh, if I had to put a word to it, I guess I would put perfect peace. Because there's no feeling to it. It's like you're walking by the light. So let me ask you this. So how does somebody put belief in themselves? When no one can do that. You don't even put doubt in yourself. You're just overreacting to the doubter, the one, the one that caused you to doubt. But when you doubt that lie, then belief is of your Father God, so it's, it's already there anyway. You just come into the presence of it. But why would you disbelieve anything? Why not just have belief? Because you said... Because don't, you can't make you could, yourself believe. Because you said don't believe your thoughts, which is the opposite of belief. Right. Why would you have the opposite of something? Why don't you just have belief? Because most people have not been born again. They, are op- they have not overcome that fallen state. So all they have is doubt. And so when you repent for being wrong, when you realize that you are no good person, that you are very judgmental and angry and you know that you're no good, then you, follow, you start to fall away from doubt and belief is there. Yeah, I don't think you're understanding what I'm saying. I mean, you, you, you specifically saying? said that if you, da- if, if you doubt your doubt, which I said, what does that mean? And you go, don't believe your thoughts. Right. You're telling me not to believe something. But what I'm saying is, that's a neg- to me, that's a negative action, not to believe something. And it's belief... negative? Yeah, not to do something. Don't believe your thoughts. So my question to you is, why not just believe? Because and, you can't believe on your own. Well, how do you not believe then? When you... When you like I just said, when you repent, you start to overcome your father, the devil. And now you, you, you see, you, you're allowed to see that he is a lie. And you just start not believing the lie anymore. I don't know how else to tell you. you just, and when you don't believe that lie, then the truth is, the faith is there. As a matter of fact, faith is always there. But the lie, you, so because you're in that fallen state, you've not overcome that nature you're more familiar with the lie, the voice of the liar, than you are with the voiceless voice of faith. But only God can show you that it's the lie. You can't show yourself that it's the lie. Only God can show you. Well, you come, once you recognize your, once you're born again, you recognize God's voice. That allows you to know that this other thing is a lie because God's voice it has no voice. It's a voiceless voice. And then once you become familiar with his voice, then you notice the other thing is a lie. Then one thing, the difference between God, the truth, and the Satan, the lie, when you're in the presence of God, it's, it's just, a, it's just a, a peaceful presence to be in, presence to be in. 
and it's not based on how you feel, what you think. None of that is involved in it. You just see what is right without having to feel anything. Whereas with, uh, El, whereas with Satan, in our fallen state, we are so accustomed to having something to associate it with, whether it's feeling or thoughts or anger or whatever, happiness, that we think that that's what God being with God is like as well, and it's not. It's not like that at all. We're subject to letting God take control. And when you say doubt the doubt, uh-huh. that's an action. That's an that's action? A, that's an oh, that's action. what this person is talking about. They yeah, think you're, that you're I trying mean, to take it as, as now you've got to take an action, and now you have to watch and doubt the doubt. That's a very good point. That's exactly what they said. They said, well, when I hear you say that, it made me think that I need to take an action. Yeah. But you and don't. See, I don't. I, that's where I'm losing you when you say that. It kind of like confuses me because it puts me to a struggle. Uh-huh. Now I have that's to struggle exactly what to they become said too. doubt, to, look, to watch the doubt. And I don't want to do that. I want to be able <laughs> to just look at it and go, so what? You know what I mean? Yes. Walk away and say, so, it ain't no big deal. It's going to say it anyway. I could care less. I don't want to struggle with it. That's, that's the point that they were making. And, and, and that's what you guys are trying to say, right? Are you saying that, Kent? Yeah, I'm saying that. Oh, okay. I'm all, I got to know. I'm also going a little further because I think doubt the doubt is, uh, implies action. But oh. then you told me to be inactive, which is not to believe, which is another negative action. So now you have me doing two different things. <laughs> And then on top wow, of it, wow, I understand. Oh, I got you and now. And then on top of it, you said, "Well, belief just exists." So then I'm like, "Why don't I just believe rather than not believe?" I mean, it, to me, that's that's for me what it is. Okay, that is so interesting. So how do I get you to not take an action when I say doubt the doubt? I don't mean that there's something you need to be doing, like making yourself doubt. Wow. I think y'all just going to have to suffer for a week. <laughs> I, I think I know. You just have to come to Christ. You just have to just just call upon him. That's oh, what I do. I just no, say, okay, Jesus, there I am again. Okay. You just can't I just come to Christ. come back to Christ. You that's sound like what I do. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. <laughs> come to Jesus right now. Just now. To the awareness. There has to be something that brings you to the point to realize that of yourself, you could do nothing. Of yourself, you know nothing. Then you wouldn't think to take action when it's about spiritual things. And I, and I think that's what happened with me. I realized that years ago, I couldn't change myself. I didn't know how to do it. Of myself, I could do nothing. And it just caused me to stop trying to take any action because it's all spiritual and there's nothing we can do. And I think then, when I say that, Satan can't tell you there's an action you need to take. Because you've already tried to change your life, right? And you have not been able to change of yourself. Because we are a spirit created in the image of God who created us. And then there's Satan fighting against that. And because, until we are born again, he's influencing us in the spirit. And when we can realize that of ourselves we can do nothing, I never take action now to try to change myself with those things. I'm just the, the, the observer now. And more and more I do it, the more easier it becomes. Because I've realized that of myself I can do nothing. So if I don't, if it doesn't happen, there's nothing I can do anyway. And if it does happen, there's nothing I can do anyway. I just accept it. I put up no... Uh, no, I put up no fight, no war, no nothing, just live it. Because there's nothing I can do. So that's me. I used to say, I want to do the right thing. I went to church, I gave the money, I read the Bible, and yet I'm doing these things that I don't want to do. And you realize after a while, when God calls you to realize, you can't do anything. So why be mad at yourself? And let go. And then you don't put up a struggle. You know, Jesse, I think the hook uh, which caused me to believe all kind of ridiculous little thoughts um, 
is it appeals directly to my vanity. There's a, um, like say if a, a funny thought comes into my head, I want to say that so I can look like I'm a smart guy, a witty guy. And that's, the hook is always to my vanity. Like if a smart thought comes into my head, how to overcome sin or whatever, I want to say that so I can look good. So I'll say that thought about it instead of just I really that's the time to grow from it by not by denying it and not about doubting it. But my but my um, draw it seems toward that vanity causes me to struggle with it and believe it sometimes and disbelieve it or let it go other times. Wow! Uh, When you're driving down the road, like this morning when you came in, it was a bright sunshiny day, right? That didn't take any effort on your part, right? Isn't that right? Anybody had to struggle to see the sun? <laughs> well, that's how you watch your thoughts. The same way. You just watch them without a struggle because they're just popping up. They're coming and going. And so you don't have to do it. To doubt them is simply to watch them. It doesn't mean you got to do anything. You can't. Don't try to suppress them. Don't try to control them. Don't try to decide this is good. This is bad. Don't do anything, but just watch it the same way you were coming in this morning with the bright sunshine. The thoughts are the same thing. I see that, and I really understand it, but I know that there's an underlying selfishness in me, and, and it's not me, let me put it that way, that kind of overbears and, and, and steps in, in another form, in another way, where it takes me, try to take me even lower, you know, to its level. Right. And, and, and it's all the same thing, but it's just usually trying to use more power against me because I had a struggle this week, so I, I know I lost the battle yeah. because I struggled. You go with always it. lose when you struggle. Yeah. With. I always so lose when, when I give in to it. So when the thought, let's say the thoughts come, and instead of you struggling with them, relax in them. Instead of putting forth any effort, relax in it. It's going to be painful sometimes or feel like darkness. Feel like life is over, but relax in that too. Do not insert your will at all. Let go. And that's what it means to come to God. Come to Jesus. You just let it go even in the darkness. And, and as far as Martin's comment there, I know what he means by the, uh, the temptation there, how it comes back and tries to, uh, the vanity or whatever. It's our ego. It, it gets in the way. Because I, I know I'll see people and all of a sudden, Sometimes it's not a thought. If it's not a thought, it just comes out easy and it flows. Me, but if it's a thought... This. But what I'd like for you to get rid of, uh-huh. when these things are happening, don't say, oh, there go my ego. D- don't define it either, because Satan will use that against you too. You just become the observer. Yeah. Because riding down the road today, you weren't thinking, wow, I have God made this sound so great today. It just happened to be with my ego loving this. You know, uh, blah, 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 right? You're just driving down the road, having fun, right? Mm-hmm. Same thing with the thought, because you've learned about the ego, and so he'll come with some stuff, oh, yeah. and he'll tell you, that's your ego. And then you'll say, that's my ego. He's always telling you everything. That's not God telling you it's your ego. He's using that against you because you've heard about the ego. You have to move away from that and know nothing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I understand that. I, I mean, it's it, it's just even just being even people in the room there. You know, you try to uh, like uh, how should I say? You know, you don't. I don't know his mind. I don't know what he's thinking of. I don't know what anybody. What's really your point, real fast? Of. But it's 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 like I become. Um, I I don't know what to. You know, I'm worried about what somebody else might think about what I'm saying. Let me put it that way. You are worried about that. Yeah, not you, always. It just I say you enter. are. At you times know, you worry I'm, about that. Yes. And why do you worry about that? It's stupid. I don't know. Okay, it's this stupid. that's the point. I see it. Because he is telling you, and you're not aware, they're thinking about what you're saying. They're yeah. judging you. He's talking to you in those moments to make, and you're believing it rather than doubting it, and you're feeling it, and not realize you're being tempted. Yeah, because I really want to be free and I don't care what so and so thinks. But whatever. That's I want to be myself. No, but no, he, no one cares about what you're saying anyway. Yeah, he's that's right. telling you that, and you're not watching it to know that. Right. 
You understand that? Yeah. Even when you're up speaking, he's telling you, they're judging you the way you're talking. They're, they're saying she's wrong. She's a nutcase or something, right? And you're feeling it because you're believing it. Rather than just watching it go, come and go, and just be yourself, and then you can be comfortable in the moment. There are, there are no feelings that come with belief. You can't say, well, I have doubt, and so I'm feeling all this stuff, right? Mm-hmm. So now I have faith, I'm going to feel something else. You're going to feel nothing. And that's the whole point. You have peace, and if you have perfect peace, there are no feelings. There's no doubt, no up and down in joy, no worries, no fear, no in and out, up and down, around and about. In, in, uh, when you have faith, it just is. I think the Bible even said faith is. There's nothing you can like. I think some people think once they stop doubting, then they're going to have this overwhelming joy and, and something else going to happen that you can identify as faith. But there is nothing going to happen that you can identify as faith except that you don't have the conflict anymore. You have peace. Through all things, too, no matter what you're going through, you have peace unless you fall into temptation, believing into a lie about what you're going through. When you say doubt the doubt, what do you mean by that? What do I mean when I say doubt the lie? Whenever you realize you're thinking and uh, you hear your own voice in your head or you, or you realize you're listening to your thoughts, uh, come back to the present. And that's how you doubt the lie? That's what I do, yes. It doesn't work. Well, um, uh, they always come back. Um, I come back to to the present moment, and then there's you're back doing whatever you was doing, um, but then the thoughts come back again, or you realize you're listening to your that voice in your head again. Um, I come back to the present, but that goes on. the The thoughts seem, the thoughts never go away, um, uh, but when they do, or when I realize I'm listening to that voice in my head, I come back to the present. And does it help? It, it helps, yes. In what way? Well, um, I think once you start listening to your thoughts uh, or following your thoughts, uh, you kind of go deeper into them, and uh, uh, you become more suggestible, and, and you start listening to them more and more. And to me, I realize it's better just to come back to the present moment. Uh, rather than going down you know, it's the rabbit hole of your imagination. Oh, okay. Who else? How many people know how to doubt the lie now? Um, well, last Sunday we talked about parents don't cause your kids to resent. Well, when you're mean like that with your kids, when you're impatient with your kids, when you whoop your kids with anger, then you are, are causing them to resent. I realized from that the reason that a lot of black men and women are so traumatized is because their mothers and grandmothers whooped them and smacked them upside the head while growing up with, with the intent, some of them, to make them better people. But they did it with the spirit of anger, which is hatred. And then they'll use the scripture where the Bible said, train a child, up, no, spare the rod and spoil the child, something like that, right? But the Bible was not talking about angry parents beating and correcting their children. An angry parent cannot correct a child. You have no love. There's no love and anger. And so you're trying to correct the child. You're correcting them with with anger. And then so you end up messing the kids up and you wonder what happened to them. But I noticed that with white mothers, they tend to uh, not whoop their kids or spank their kids, sometimes they do, but they tend to be very impatient with their kids. You know, like, I told you to sit down. 
Yeah, my is not going to put up with this anymore, that kind of stuff. But that's still anger. And with that anger, it still corrupts the child because there is no love in anger. Every human being who has anger is having anxiety attacks and headaches. And I'm imagining, can you imagine being raised by a woman like that? And so now as a young girl, she, she's already having these anxiety attacks and she's going to be on medication and all that kind of madness for the rest of her life. Unless someone comes along and says to her, you need to forgive your mother. She's insane. Uh, she is of her father, the devil, but you need to forgive her so you can overcome that. And she's not going to, it's rare. I hope I'm wrong, but she's not going to hear that. They're going to blame it on racism. They're going to blame it on poverty. They're going to blame it on the man. Everybody but the mother. It reminds me of those sick women that was at the Democratic National Convention. Trayvon Martin mother and uh, uh, Mike and Brown mother and the rest of the who it rats. They up there blaming everybody for the death of their kids except themselves and the adults who got killed because they overreacted to the cop. We have a, a no fault system now. Nobody, not nobody. Most people do not take responsibility for their own failures. They don't say, oh, this is, I'm wrong. I'm sorry. This is me. I'm wrong. We don't hear that. And it's always blaming somebody else when it all starts in the home. Always doubt the lie. Doubt the lie, doubt the lie, doubt the lie. And then you can have faith. And so someone asked me, well, what do you mean? And I wrote it down here. Lack love. Absolutely have no love. That's why we have to get over it, because you cause your kids, uh, you traumatize your kids. A lot of parents, they mean well. They don't mean to mess up the kids. They want what's best, but they're correcting you with the wrong spirit. And that's why you end up, you know, they end up messed up, even though you're trying to do what's right for them. I remember one time when my mom, she caught me and she, and she had like one of the big worker wooden um, things. And she used to whoop me and my brother with it. She whooped us both at the same time because it was like real long. She was like, Shh. Wow. How old were you at the time? About like seven. You were seven years old? How old are you now? Nine. Nine. Wow. And that hurt, huh? I can't hear you. Yeah, it hurt. Yeah. Yeah. And it's done with anger. That's what the problem is. You, got to, you must forgive so that you can operate from the right spirit. But that mother, that woman needs to be put in jail. She really does. She fought her daughter like a ghetto child. Like she would fight somebody in the hood, another woman in the hood. She looked like a hood rat. We want her daughter to be something else. And her daughter said that she was about to tell her mother that she were she was having sex. She wanted to tell her, but she couldn't find a way to tell her. Also, they had to end up going to the hospital. And their daughter later wrote that she went to the hospital because she... There was a black woman that uh, had a YouTube video out where she was beating her 60-year-old daughter. Did you guys see that? We have it upon our site at rebuildingtheman.com. And, and she was like pounding her and just smacking her upside the head and hitting her in the ear and just really punching her in the stomach while at the same time cursing her out, calling her uh, T-H-O-T. Do you know what that is? No. You, you, you never heard of it, huh? A thought is a whore. That's a new word for whore. The problem is the mother, the girl is just like the mother. The mother had on these little hot pants all up here. Little pink hot pants and some little hard to top thing on. Looking worse than her daughter. And she got to beat the daughter for being out of control. She was saying, you are embarrassing me. Can you imagine having a mother like that as a child? And your mother show up at school or something looking like that? 
And then the mother would get in front of the mirror and do her hair all up. And the daughter is just like the mother, but the mother doesn't see that in herself, and she's trying to make the daughter do something that she's not doing. You know.